Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Recently, there's been news about a demonstration of the technology behind a more efficient rocket engine known as a rotating detonation engine. While their design is small and generates less than 100 kilograms of thrust, it's a practical demonstration of a device which is being pursued by researchers all over the world, a device that has been theorised for decades and is predicted to be up to 25% more efficient than the ordinary garden variety rocket engine. And of course, when I say garden variety, I mean the rocket garden at Kennedy Space Centre because I don't have any rockets in my garden. Anyway, being able to get an improvement of efficiency of a rocket engine would be great when you consider that switching from a open cycle engine to a much more complicated closed cycle engine gets you a 10% improvement, a 25% improvement would be massive. And detonation engines aren't specific to rocket engines or jet engines. The, the US Navy would like to use those to power the turbines on some of their ships. So what is a rotating detonation engine and how does it work? And how can it squeeze more performance out of the same mass of propellant? The important word here is detonation, which refers to a very specific combustion process. Now, when we hear the word detonation, we associate it with explosions, but not all explosions are detonations. In modern scientific terminology, a detonation is a combustion process where the flame front moves faster than the speed of sound in the material that's burning. So here's a fun combustion experiment I did in my kitchen. I evaporated some alcohol in this bottle and then lit the mixture on fire. And in slow motion, you can see the flame front traveling down into the bottle. So the speed of that flame is dependent upon many factors and it can be made to burn faster by getting the mixture ratio correct and if things get just right the flame front can accelerate and start to move faster than the speed of sound in the gas. And at this point the unburned mixture doesn't get pushed out of the way of the incoming flame front and the flame front becomes a shock wave where the pressure and temperature rises near instantaneously. This is a detonation wave. So combustion processes with subsonic flame fronts get referred to as deflagration processes and supersonic shockwave shock-based combustion is detonation. Regular jet engines use deflagration and detonation engines use a detonation. The standout characteristic of the detonation process is that the pressure rise in the shock wave is much, much higher because there's no time for the burning propellants to undergo any thermal expansion. In scientific terms, the combustion is a constant volume process, whereas the combustion in a jet engine is a constant pressure process. So how can the detonation process be exploited to make a better engine? The simplest example of a detonation engine is the pulse detonation engine, and one of these was demonstrated in flight in 2008. This is a simple engine that was a long tube with some inlet valves at one end. First there would be a purge of air, and then a fuel-air mixture would then be injected, and as that expanded to fill the tube, you would then hit it with a spark plug which would start the combustion at the base of the tube and initially it would burn as a deflagration but then as it progressed down it became a detonation and if you did this just right you could make several pulses per second and get thrust out of it so this transition was why the engine had to be so long it actually extended far past the rear of the plane they looked like big long drain pipes so the engines in that test vehicle would pulse 20 times per second and there were four of them so they had like an 80 hertz pulsing. And at this point I should also mention that there are other pulse jets. The, the V1 missile was powered by a pulsed engine but it used mechanical slats and it wasn't a detonation. Hell, there's even the U-shaped pulse jets built by uh, Colin Furs who's also on YouTube but these are not detonation engines because the combustion isn't supersonic. So in theory, pulse detonation engines can exceed the efficiency of regular jet engines, but the purge and pulse cycle means that it's not generating thrust all the time. So the rotating detonation engine takes this concept and tries to make the detonation a continuous process. Instead of the detonation wave traveling down a long tube, it's confined to travel around a circular cavity. The propellant mixture is fed in uh, along the tube and it detonates and is expelled at the other. Therefore, the detonation wave travels around this cavity in a circle as long as the conditions sustain it. That's the theory, 
But of course, making it work is the trick. And there's been lots of theoretical CFD models showing how waves might work, how they could be tuned and controlled, but the actual physical demonstrations have been elusive. The hard part is maintaining the conditions inside your annular combustion chamber so that the detonation wave continues to move. Uh, frequently, they're working with multiple detonation waves chasing each other, and they all need to move at exactly the same speed. If you get the conditions wrong, then one uh, wave might start to catch up on the other. Uh, it's possible that you can have unburned propellant expel out the back and burn there, losing you efficiency, or even worse, exploding. Or the detonation wave could simply just blow itself out. But the advantages could be huge. An air-fed detonation engine could eliminate many of the moving parts. It wouldn't need the compressor that's typical at the front of a jet engine. And after all, a few atmospheres of compression is kind of wimpy compared to the 100 plus atmospheres you can get inside a detonating shockwave. It's believed that air-breathing detonation engines could provide usable thrusts for hypersonic propulsions up to about Mach 5, which isn't possible with conventional jets. So now... Many of you probably want to know why scientists have so much expectation of the performance of a device that's not read, really been built. What is the theoretical underpinning for all this hope? And for that, unfortunately, I'm going to have to give you a little bit of a lesson in thermodynamics of heat engines. Now, if you've done physics, you know all this, but there's other people here that might want to know. So a heat engine is an idealized device that takes heat from a high temperature source and moves it to a low temperature sink, while siphoning off a portion of that to do useful work. And a simple example is where you take a cylinder that's closed with a moving piston and you heat the gas inside it, that will cause the piston to move and it'll do work. Then you can attach it to a cold reservoir which will cool the gas and the cylinder will retract and it'll also do work. Now, in that process, you've moved some heat from the hot reservoir to the cold reservoir, but you've also got some mechanical work out of it. And you can actually figure out the efficiency of the engine by the mechanical work out to the amount of heat transferred. So as it turns out that on some level, every engine is a heat engine. And it doesn't matter if it has pistons or cylinders or turbine blades. If you can get mechanical work out from heat flow, it's a heat engine. Even the weather on the planet Earth is a kind of heat engine as the sun's heat causes gas to circulate and move around. So you can describe the operation of every heat engine by tracking how its pressure, volume, temperature and entropy change over time. So the simple gas in a cylinder I described is kind of like a, an idealized Stirling engine. And I have a diagram here which shows how the pressure and the volume changes over time on this. So if we just start at position one, that's where the cylinder is hot and it's full of compressed gas. So as we go from one to two, the gas is now expanding, the pressure is dropping and the volume is increasing and it's doing mechanical work. At that point, you put it in touch with the cold reservoir, the temperature drops down from two to three, so that moves vertically, the volume remains the same. And now because the temperature has dropped, the pressure has dropped, so the cylinder wants to contract and does so along these lines with the volume decreasing and pressure increasing back to the ambient, we end up at four, where we allow the gas to warm again from the hot reservoir so it rises back up to one. So that is the cycle of the engine. And you can draw other diagrams that show how uh, its temperature changes with respect to the entropy. The really important thing about these diagrams is that you can actually figure out how much energy is transferred or converted to work by looking at the area enclosed by these lines. So you can figure out the efficiency of the engine by looking at the volume inside there. So rockets and jet engines, they use the Brayton cycle, which looks like this. And in this case, the heat is transferred or applied at constant pressure with the working fluid expanding inside the combustion chamber. So on this diagram that steps three to four where the pressure remains the same, but the volume increases because the temperature is being added. So note that in this diagram, by the way, that it's not a closed gas inside a cylinder. The, at point eight, you've got the gas being exhausted and then being replaced by fresh inlet air. Now, detonation engines use the Humphrey cycle, which adds the heat at constant volume, which means that instead of steps three to four going horizontally, it goes vertically. 
And this changes the shape of your cycle and actually gives you more area to work inside. So therefore, it's anticipated that a detonation cycle should get more power out of the same heat input. So look, that's the theory. And of course, in practice, there are efficiency losses and engineering considerations that push your cycle away from the ideal. For example, you might not be able to exploit higher temperatures and pressures because of the materials that you're working with. Or say in the pistons in the Stirling engine, those are supposed to move up and stay still and then down and stay still. But in practice, they move kind of in a sine wave pattern. So the real working Stirling engines don't get the same efficiency as idealized engines. So you know, right now, detonation engines have taken a few small steps to being more than a theoretical device. But beyond that, they do need to be developed into real working devices and actually demonstrate that they're able to achieve the levels of power and efficiency that the mathematics suggests. Mm -hmm.